David Lee in Edinburgh, and I think he's one of the main proponents of the current development uh, in this world, so in that sense I'm proud to introduce him. And uh, I don't think I'm going to waste more time with the introduction because he, uh, he already a little bit late in this case. Maybe as a personal note, I can also recommend his, his publications to him, but at least for me, they've had a, an important impact on the ones I most like, or one of the ones I most like too. Thanks, David, and it's a pleasure to be here. I met a lot of new people, and uh, and it's it's fascinating how similar a wavelength many people are on. Uh, so that, that's really cool. so. I'm going to talk about behavioral dynamics, which in my terms is actually quite similar uh, to Randy's uh, concepts about this, which um, uh, as, as you'll see. So, and I'm going to particularly try to talk about behavioral dynamics at the individual level and at the collective level and try to connect the two. So we'll see how I do for time. Um, I was struck by the presence, uh, the prevalence of Alan Turing on the Redicog website given the Turing year last year. And it, it caused me to uh, realize that there are, or just to remind everyone that there are two Alan Turings, right? There's one who was the father of computer science, as we think of it, um, developed the theory, the theory of computation, famous Turing test that um, we're all still puzzling over, um, and basically introduced the idea of cognition as computation into the world. Uh, but there's the other Alan Turing, who was also uh, the father of pattern formation in a famous 1952 paper, basically did the first analysis of reaction fusion systems, which he uh, modeled as a couple dynamical systems, and um, leads to, I think, the other thread of cognition perhaps as self-organizing dynamics, and those are some of the Turing patterns that he originally thought of as spatial patterns that might explain code patterns, for example, on animals. Um, so, interesting. So, um, the website also kind of represents these two Turings in, in uh, physical form, right, with the brain and the brain with legs. So I think we're uh, leaning towards the brain with legs today. So I want to talk about what I take to be kind of the fundamental problem in all of our fields when we're thinking about human behavior, animal behavior, or even animal behavior. Um, we observe order and pattern at multiple levels in various systems in human and animal behavior. The level of motor control, there's motor coordination among the many degrees of freedom of the body. Um, when we're performing actions in an environment, we're coupled to that environment, so there are agent-environment interactions. Um, there's collective behavior of groups of agents, so you might think of this as agent-agent interactions, or maybe the other agents are part of a single agent's environment. Um, and social interactions, okay, which are also agent-agent interactions that are, are governed by social constraints. So all of these exhibit patterns of behavior, order, organization. And the deep problem I think of in the field is where does the organization of behavior come from? Uh, and so I often like to start with my favorite quote from James Gibson, who is admonishing us uh, up there in the corner, where Gibson says, control lies not in the brain, but in the animal environment system. Behavior is regular without being regulated. The question is how this can be. This is one of Gibson's Zen koans that I'm still struggling with to try to understand. So what I think Gibson meant, right, is that the field often acts as though it's studying this, okay? when in actual, in fact, right, it's studying this. The brain is embedded in a, embodied in a body and embedded in a physical environment. There are lots of constraints in that total system which, which may account for a portion of the organization of behavior. So um, what I think Gibson was trying to say in our current terminology is that biology exploits all of these constraints, physical, ecological, informational constraints, as a means of organizing behavior, ordering behavior. And so behavior is self-organizing. That is, it's not prescribed by the brain, contrary to the current zeitgeist in cognitive neuroscience, but rather emerges as a stable solution of the dynamics of this entire system. So this is a theme we've heard a lot already today. One of my favorite examples of this contrast is um, uh, two robots, right, that have very different attitudes toward explo exploiting physics. So we're all familiar with the Honda Asimo robot, 
It has 26 actuators, one at each joint, so it's computationally very expensive. It's prescribing the state of all of those degrees of freedom at every moment, um, and it's very energetically expensive. The control of transport, um, which is a measure of efficiency, is 3.2. Okay. Contrast that with uh, the, later, the later development of passive dynamic walkers. Um, they are designed to exploit physics, so their um, limbs are acted as physical pendulums and the whole system is as an inverted pendulum. It controls exactly one degree of freedom, okay, an actuator at the angle so that it doesn't run out of steam, right, so it can actually continue to make forward progression. And it's computationally very light as a result of that. And the cost of transport is an order of magnitude lower than the Asimo. Uh, it's about the cost of transport of humans. So if you look at these systems, right, here we've got a system which is embodied in a physical body, embedded in an environment, in this case a ground plane in a gravitational field, and that simplifies the control problem dramatically for what remains of our brain. I think of these organizational problems as really, uh, there are two sides to this problem of organization. One is that behavior is stable. Okay, it tends to be ordered and regular. So the gate patterns of the passive dynamic robots are extremely stable limit cycles. Okay. But on the other hand, human and animal behavior is also highly adaptive. So how is it that behavior is not only ordered and regular, but also functionally specific to the task or goal that it, it basically takes various means to achieve the same end? And I attribute the first, the stability of the agent harnessing physical laws in order to achieve self-organizing dynamics. And the adaptivity is due to the agent harnessing control laws, that is, informational mappings from information that tunes the dynamics of the system and makes it functional in that way. So those are the kind of two sides of the problem I'm going to try to keep in mind as we go through this. So here's the framework that, that I use, um, very similar. Uh, so this, you know, the antecedents to this way of thinking about it are clearly um, from uh, Scott Kelso and Michael Turvey and Randy in his uh, papers in the 90s. Um, where thinking about it as a, at the behavioral level, I tend to suppress the brain, although it is in here a little bit. Um, you can think about this problem of as being represented in terms of two dynamical systems that are coupled together mechanically and informationally. So the environment is a little dynamical system. That's just the laws of physics. Uh, the agent is also a dynamical system in the sense that the state of change in the agent depends on its current state and the informational variables that it's, uh, are modulating those dynamics. Um, and the couplings here are mechanical, so uh, the action system generates forces that change the state of the environment and those changes generate new information about the relation between the agent and the environment, which then acts to modulate the agent's uh, actions again. So that's at the level of, of the perception action cycle, those two coupled dynamical systems. Um, that interaction also has a dynamics of its own that we can analyze at a higher level, just as Randy said this morning, where there is what I think of as the behavioral dynamics. It's, it's, the changes in the state of the agent environment system as a whole. So some state variables that are changing, evolving in time as a result of this interaction. So it's a kind of abstract characterization of the interaction. So what is behavioral dynamics? I think of it as the study of change in the agent environment system over time. And the argument that I'm going to make is that the behavior that we observe corresponds to solutions of this whole system's dynamics. Um, the dynamics have dynamical properties, all right? stability properties, attractors, repellers, bifurcations, and so on, that, um, that are determining right, or driving the stable states and transitions in behavior. And that's the idea. So somehow, the agent is harnessing these relationships, including control laws here, um, ecological laws and physical laws here, Right? And what the agent has at its disposal is this little control law that tweaks the dynamics of this entire system in which it's embedded. And so that's where the brain is. It's kind of buried right, in that control law. So somehow that gets you know, um, uh, embodied in a brain. But I'm going to look at it at a functional uh, level, uh, kind of a functional level description, where we're looking at, at these sorts of functional relationships. 
do, try to do, in the time that remains, is look at two case studies where we've tried to apply this behavioral dynamics way of thinking to, um, to actual behavior. So um, I tend to get my insights in by looking at um, human behavior. Other people get their insights from looking at model systems or animal behavior. And so this time, what I'm going to try to do is talk about two human tasks and how we can try to analyze them within this framework. So at the individual level, I'm going to talk about bouncing a ball on a racket, okay, rhythmic bouncing. Um, and that's a particular kind of agent-environment interaction. And the question I'm going to try to pose there is, are physics and information actually exploited in the performance of this task, in the organization of this task? And then I want to talk about the relationship between individual and collective behavior by thinking about pedestrians and crowds. So crowds are collections of agents that have uh, a self-organizing dynamics of their own, um, where the environment now is this other set of agents that you're interacting with. And the question I want to ask is, do these sorts of local interactions between agents generate collective crowd behavior? Okay? And is that, can we understand that as a self-organizing process? So first, let's do a little ball bounce, and then we'll get to, uh, to locomotion and crowds. So this is work that I've done over the last 10 years or so with Isabel Sigle and Benoit Bardi in France, um, and several students as well. And the idea of this was really introduced by Dagmar Sternad back in the, in the 90s as kind of a model system for studying the dynamics of the agent environment interaction. I mean, that's what's, what's brilliant about this stupid little system, okay? It turns out to be amazingly complicated, even though it seems trivial and simple. So what's the task? The task is um, to bounce a ball on a racket, um, and so here's the ball's trajectory, here's the racket oscillation, um, the ball has, the ball racket system has an elasticity or a coefficient of restitution, and it's bouncing in a gravitational field. The task is to bounce the ball to a target height and to keep that going. So how does the system find a solution to this? I'm going to show you a, a, an example, a video of this kind of ball bouncing. If we can make it work. Yeah. Okay, so here's kind of extreme ball bouncing. Okay. This can be done by juggling, uh, back bouncing and bouncing on a bounce, but all at the same time. So now we've got multiple couple dynamical systems, all right, all coordinated together. That's so amazing but true. That's not what we studied. We studied a simple reduced case, right, of one ball. So what um, Dagmar and her colleagues, uh, Stefan Shaw and Thierry Dijkstra, showed was that bouncing is actually a passively stable system. Um, under certain conditions, if the racket is moving as a harmonic oscillator, and the impact of the ball occurs in the last half of the upswing of the racket, so at a point around there, um, so the racket is decelerating at that point, so it's accelerating up to the midpoint and then decelerating up, decelerating up to the peak. Um, if the ball makes contact in that deceleration phase, the whole system is self-stabilizing. Right? What that means is if you perturb the ball, all right, um, and the racket is completely blind, right, the bouncer is completely blind and maintains this, uh, this harmonic motion, the ball will self-stabilize and come back to stable period one bouncing at a given height. So here's a, an example of that in the simulation, um, where here's a bunch of different perturbations at the onset of this pattern, and with the harmonic motion of the racket, it all converges back to the same trajectory. Okay, so that's passive stability. Passive stability uh, is satisfied all right, if the acceleration of the racket at the time it meets the ball is less than zero, but greater than this relationship between gravity and elasticity. So, what they showed was that active control is completely unnecessary. You could achieve this task through purely exploiting the passive physics of the situation. And interestingly enough, Dr. and her colleagues came up with some data showing that this appears to be true. So, here's uh, their data. This is Excel, the standard deviation of acceleration at impact um, against different values of acceleration. So, the scatter plots are um, the data from different subjects. And this is a Lyapunov stability analysis that shows the maximum stability range is down here within uh, accelerations of, you know, around minus 2 to minus 
five or so, five or six. And indeed, that's where the data cluster in this negative range. That's how people, these are practice bouncers, okay, expert ball bouncers. That's how they manage to keep the ball going. So it looks like um, people are taking advantage or exploiting physics, right? They're just doing this passive, passively stable bouncing. And if she then had them close their eyes, they could keep this going without looking at the ball. Okay. I should mention this is one-dimensional bouncing, so they don't have to spatially right, keep the ball going. It's just a timing question. The ball only moves on a vertical trajectory in these experiments. So this is completely consistent with passive stability. No evidence that there's visual control of any kind. However, we subsequently found in 2003 that bouncing can be maintained outside the passively stable region. So you can bounce, and here are a few examples, you can bounce out here the positive acceleration range, which is actually destabilizing. It makes the ball go at various amplitudes. So how does that work? How can it both be passive and active? This led us to consider several hypotheses about how the sort of agent environment interaction might be controlled. Well, the first hypothesis was, was Dogmar's original hypothesis, which is passive stability. There's no perceptible control at all. You're just locked into the physics of the situation. The opposite extreme is active control, where you ignore the passive stability properties of the system completely and actively regulate every single cycle. Okay? And there are a number of robotic control algorithms that do just this. Here's one from Todorov's lab. Change 
the period, the half period of the ball's uh, flight. If we increase gravity at the peak, we also did the opposite. Um, on the other hand, we also changed elasticity upon impact. So for example, if you increase the coefficient of restitution at impact, that's going to increase the time up and the peak height of the ball's trajectory um, and affect those things as well on the way down. So these are different ways of, of perturbing the system and trying to look at the responses that change the ball's trajectory in slightly different ways. Well, so what are the results of this first set of experiments? Well, we did observe a rapid adjustment in the racket motion. So here's the uh, number of cycles of bouncing. Here is the ratio of racket period, uh, pre-perturbation, or post-perturbation, pre-perturbation. And what you see is that if you increase gravity on cycle zero here, on the next cycle, the next impact, number one, right, there's already a huge adjustment in the period of the racket. Okay? So if we increase gravity, the period of the racket speeds up, right? Because the ball is going to arrive sooner than it did before we change gravity. Um, and that's for different levels of perturbation. We see that rapid adjustment in the first post-perturbation cycle. So that's consistent with the observer monitoring the motion of the ball on every cycle and making adjustments in every cycle. That looks like active control. Um, when we look at the error to the target, okay, so this is a way of getting at the relaxation time of the system. Again, the perturbation is here, and the um, error increases, right, on the next cycle. But over the next two or three cycles, the error goes back to where it was before. So the relaxation time for these perturbations in gravity is only two cycles. The passive stability uh, theory pr predicts many cycles, as you saw in that earlier simulation, you know, eight to 10 cycles in order to recover. And in this case, people are recovering in two cycles. So this is, again, consistent with active control. So what's the deal? Okay, we've got evidence for passive control. We've got evidence for active control. What's going on? Well, one way to look at this is what happens when the system is stable or unstable, right? Do we see racket adjustments in both those cases? So when you change the racket, so when you increase gravity and destabilize the system, so you move the system outside of the passively stable range, you see the predicted adjustment. This is the data I just showed you. Um, but if you perturb it in another way, so in this case you decrease gravity, and that actually moves the system further into the stable region. So it's, uh, you still see an adjustment on that first cycle. So it looks like you're getting rapid adjustments whether the perturbation destabilizes the system or stabilizes the system. And so that's contrary to this idea of hybrid control that you're only responding when you're moved outside the passively stable region. Um, it is, however, consistent with this idea of mixed control, that you're constantly monitoring the ball, visually, in this case, monitoring the ball, and making appropriate adjustments, but you're doing so to keep the system close to the passively stable region, because there the adjustments are uh, more minimal. So, what are our conclusions about control mode? So far, data look inconsistent with passive, active, hybrid, but very consistent with mixed control so that you're actively regulating every cycle in order to minimize the racket adjustments that you have to make. Um, and indeed, this is the sort of thing that actuated passive dynamic robots do. So this is Russ Tedrick's robot, which actually has built some sensors into uh, the center of gravity and to the limbs. And so it's able to adapt okay, to changes in the environment. So it's using information to modify the dynamics of the system in order to adapt to new conditions. So this may be a kind of, I think of this as a possible general solution for Asian environment interactions because it shows how you can exploit the physics of the task and use information to modulate the physics of the task um, in order to achieve both stable behavior and adaptive behavior. It's that integration of information and dynamics. So how does that work? How does the information get used to modulate the dynamics? So here we want to start looking at control laws, right? What are the control laws? How are informational variables mapped into the control variables? So once you've got your dynamical system organized, right, there are a few variables that, uh, of information that may be used to control the free control variables of the action system. And so in our system, we can think about this, what are the control variables? Well, the critical ones are the period of the racket motion, 
okay, that's going to drive the ball in a periodic fashion. And the velocity of the racket at, at impact, because that's going to determine how high the ball goes and how long it's going to be in the air. So if you're trying to reach the target, that's the critical variable for uh, achieving the goal, that is for reaching the target. So error here is related to the peak of the ball's flight, okay, it's basically the same variable. And the time up and the time down, um, and the velocity of the ball at impact, those are all visual variables that may be used to achieve uh, control. Okay, so our two control variables are the period of the racket and the impact velocity. And our hypothesized visual variables, optical variables, are the launch velocity of the ball, because that determines the time it remains before it's going to come back to the uh, contact height. The peak height of the ball, or the error, because that's also related to how long it's going to take the ball to return back to the impact height. And the flight period. So the duration of the upward half of the trajectory is equal to the duration of the downward half of the trajectory. And so you can use that to control the period of the racket. So all of these variables normally are confounded. Okay? And so in order to dissociate them, we perturb uh, the gravity and the velocity of impact jointly okay, in various ways to try to isolate changes in some of these variables. And then we look at the racket adjustments to try to figure out okay, what informational variables uh, are being used to control the racket motion or to correct for error. So first question, what's, how do we visually control the period of the racket motion? All right, we have three candidate variables for that. Um, well, in this particular experiment, we perturb the duration of the upward uh, half of the ball's trajectory but kept the constant, the height of the trajectory the same as it would be um, if you hadn't perturbed it, all right? So you hit the ball with a certain velocity, it goes to the, con to the height it would ordinarily, but by changing gravity, right, we change the duration of the upward flight of the trajectory. Okay, so we're trying to dissociate these variables. And what you see, so here's racket period on the pre-perturbation uh, uh, cycle and on the first post-perturbation cycle, um, and you can see that regardless of the magnitude of the perturbation, there is an adjustment, small perturbations, large perturbations. And indeed, the magnitude of the adjustment is proportional to the perturbation. Um, and it's almost complete correction, which is that red line. So on the first impact after the perturbation, people are almost completely adjusting their racket period to match the ball's period. Okay, so one piece of information on one cycle. So that's consistent with mixed control, because it's happening at all levels of perturbation. So then we go in and do correlations between these optical variables that we've dissociated um, and the racket period. All right, so here are four hypotheses, or really three hypotheses. The velocity of the ball at impact should predict the time of the ball's flight. The height of the ball's flight should predict its time. The duration of the upward period should predict the duration of the downward period. And then that's the duration of the downward period. Well, before the perturbation, all four variables correlate very highly with racket period. They're all confounded. But after the perturbation, where we dissociate them, the one that correlates most highly is indeed the duration of the upward flight of the ball. So that is the same as it was before the perturbation. So we interpret this to mean that people are using the duration, this period of the upward half of the ball's trajectory, right, to adjust the racket period to match so the racket's in the right place when the ball comes back down. So there's a simple control law, a period controller, where the period of the racket is equal to two times the period of the upward flight of the ball. And if you just keep doing that, you will always be in the right place, your racket will always be in the right place when the ball arrives, right, and you will match the period of the ball. So that's a very simple uh, sort of control law. What about error correction? How do you get the ball to the target um, if you've missed it on the previous uh, 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 stroke? So this again looks at the pre-perturbation uh, error and the uh, uh, error on the first peak after the perturbation. And what you can see is again that the error here, sorry, this is racket velocity, okay, pre-perturbation, racket velocity, post-perturbation, depending on the perturbation magnitude. And as you can see, the magnitude of the racket velocity is proportional to the magnitude of the perturbation. And so people are indeed correcting right, their racket velocity depending on the, the error we introduced in the perturbation. Um, 
And so, it also, this is the first post perturbation cycle, and when you look at the errors, they get almost completely corrected in that first cycle. So now we do the correlations. This time we're trying to understand how people correct for error. And so we're looking at the correlation with the error to the target and what happens to the racket on the next impact. And it turns out that people don't actually adjust, control the velocity of the racket at impact to achieve a particular target height. Rather, they control the change in racket velocity from the previous impact to adjust for a change in the racket in the ball's height. So if you've got some error from the previous impact, you change the velocity from the previous impact in order to correct for that error. And so here's the correlation between um, error and the velocity of the racket at the next impact uh, versus the change in velocity from the pre-perturbation to the post-perturbation impact. And what you can see is that that um, correlates uh, highly. So it looks like there's a simple control law that achieves error correction in this task too, which is um, given the error, you do a change in the racket velocity from what you did the last time, um, and that yields a correction in the error. So we end up in this sort of age environment interaction with a fairly simple story. Um, by taking advantage of the physics of this whole loop, okay, we're actively using information to just tweak it a little bit. So we want to make sure that our racket period is matching the ball's period. Um, and that's the period controller. And we want to be able to correct for error, because there's always error and noise in, in behavior like this. And so the change in the racket velocity is a function of the error. And those two simple control laws will uh, successfully stabilize and maintain bouncing close to the passively stable. So this sort of control strategy, um, I think, is a general solution that may, it's worth looking at it in other types of control motor tasks as well. All right, I'm going to move on quickly and start talking about locomotion. Um, so locomotion is an interesting case because it allows us to really look at the, the bridge from individual behavior to collective behavior. So here's a, a nice video downloaded, I think, from India, okay, from the web, and this sort of crowd behavior. You can look at this at the individual level. Right? So there's an individual traveling through this crowd. Um, but then there are also groups of individuals that are moving together for a period of time and then go their separate ways. Or some that are uh, maybe a family that's traveling together as an ensemble through this larger group. Um, so at the collective level, you see these uh, formations arising and then dissolving depending on the circumstances. And so the question we want to ask at the individual level is, how do people locomote through a complex changing environment like this? So this is really a question of trajectory formation, much as reaching to an object is a question of trajectory formation. But here it's a locomotor trajectory. Um, and so can we understand that as arriving or emerging out of the interaction between the agent and its environment? Um, so the, the, is the trajectory that we see a result of the dynamics of that interaction? And then at the collective level, can we, we have an understanding of how individuals guide their locomotion. Can we understand collective behavior as emerging from all those local interactions to produce global self-organization? So that's a question of, of crowd formation. How do coherent crowds emerge? And so we think of this as a question of self-organization and in Hawkins' uh, synergetics framework, um, there's their individuals, and as those individuals interact with each other, okay, they generate some sort of coherent um, structure. But that coherent structure then has to act back to capture or enslave the individuals, and that's the mechanism of self-organization. So emergence alone isn't enough. You've got to have this downward and upward causality in order to, under to understand this as a self-organization. So we're hoping to try to get to that question. Um, there are a bunch of models out there. I'm not going to spend much time on this. Um, the most famous is Craig Reynolds' Boys uh, model, which now has been used in a lot of animation and films and you know, so on. So um, the problem with most of these models is that they're not based on real data. Right? There are a few intuitions, some observations of, yeah, fish tend to, to swim in certain patterns, but there's no rigorous measurement of data that's informing these models. And so we decided to say, let's take an experimental approach to this 
that's going to kind of converge from the bottom up and the top down to try to get at a model of how uh, crowds form. So bottom up, we're going to start looking at individuals and how they guide their locomotion, build a pedestrian model for an individual, and then see if we can use that model to simulate crowd behavior. At the same time, we're going to measure some crowds, right, which we've just started to do, um, and we're going to use that crowd data to test our model, collect data in different scenarios, um, and maybe we can also make measurements on that crowd data to try to derive the coupling relationships that we uh, are using in our model. So we can kind of converge on uh, the appropriate, uh, kind of empirically adequate model. So let's start looking at individual behavior. This is the problem. Okay? We all solve this problem on a daily basis when we cross the street, for example, maybe not quite at that speed. But it is this question of how you steer through a complex changing environment. Um, the typical solution in robotics and cognitive science is what's called model-based control, where you use your sensors to build an internal model of the environment, you use that internal model to predict the future, and then to generate a path of safe travel through this complex environment. Um, and we're going to say, you know, let's see if we can do this just with online behavior, online control. We're going to look at the dynamics of this interaction and see if the trajectories, we can account for trajectories as emerging in this online fashion rather than being pre-planned. So it's more like surfing, okay, if you will, than it is like pre-planning your route. So, we started by decomposing, trying to decompose the problem into some components. So let's imagine there's some elementary behaviors, like we steer to a goal. While we do that, we avoid obstacles. Uh, the goal might be moving, okay, so that's an interception task. And the obstacles might be moving, right, so you've got to avoid moving obstacles. Um, there might be other interactions between pedestrians, like following. How do you follow a neighbor? Um, and so those, are, those components, if you add them together, may get you Local interactions may yield certain kinds of crowd behavior. And so that's the question. Uh, so I'm going to go through very quickly the pedestrian model, which we've built experiment after experiment, tried to, to model it. Uh, but I'm not going to go through much of that data. I'm just going to describe the results. Um, so the pedestrian model basically says, how does an individual generate a path of locomotion based on the current visual information about the world? So here's the pedestrian, there's their current heading direction, the direction of travel. Um, that is specified by optic flow, it's specified proprioceptively, there's lots of information that tells you your current direction of travel through the world. But there are objects out there in the environment too. So suppose the object is a goal. What do you want to do to steer to a goal? Well, you may have some current error between your current heading and the goal direction, and so as you move, you want to bring that error to zero. Okay, very simple. Um, but the goal may also, this may also be an obstacle, and if it's an obstacle, you might want to then increase that angle, okay, as you move uh, through the world. So what we did is we started out by just measuring a bunch of these elementary behaviors in simple experiments, and then modeled each one as a simple dynamical system. Gregor Scherner and his colleagues originally did this using first-order dynamical systems to program a robot. Um, we are using second-order dynamical systems because we're concerned about moving our masses around in space. And then we're going to combine these comp components to try to predict more complicated behavior. We collect this data in the VET lab at Brown, the Virtual Environment Navigation Lab, which is a large open room, a um, 12 by 12 meter room with a tracking system in the ceiling. The subject wears a head-mounted display and walks around so we can put them in any virtual environment uh, that we want uh, and update the world in real time. So let's just march through these components, okay? Very simple, very, very quickly. It's not quite not exactly simple. But let's start with steering toward a goal. But what we want to do is null our error, okay, between our current heading and the goal direction. And so we modeled this as a second order system, a damped spring, an angular spring. So as the observer moves through the world, it's pulled, their heading is pulled into alignment with the direction of the goal. There's an equation, it describes this manifold. So basically, if you're heading to the left of the goal, you'll turn to the right. If you're heading to the right of the goal, you'll turn to the left. And the attraction right, of that goal decreases with distance. 
So you turn faster toward near goals, and you turn more slowly to goals that are farther away. And so that ends up with a, um, a simulation that looks like this. All right, so the subject for this animation made a turn and ended up on heading a straight, uh, straight path to the goal. So it's pretty simple. Um, the data uh, that we collected in humans walking the goals in different directions looks like this, and the model generates paths that are very similar. Here's the time series of steering. The heading error goes to zero over time, um, and the model generates very similar uh, trajectories on, on average with R squares or so it's a good description of this sort of uh, goal behavior. What about an obstacle? Well, we can play a simple trick by saying, all right, instead of having a negative uh, stiffness that pulls the heading into alignment with the goal, we can use a positive stiffness that will push the heading away from the direction of the goal. Um, now, you don't want it to keep pushing or else you'll spin around, OK? So it decays with the, as the angle increases, this decays. So that basically creates a little potential function that's a hill. So if you're heading um, just to the right of the obstacle, you'll steer away to the right. If you're heading just to the left of the obstacle, you'll steer away to the left. And this component only comes into play, we, we found through experiments, within very short distances, within obstacles that are three to four meters away. And beyond that distance, you just ignore obstacles, basically. Your behavior only gets influenced as you approach obstacles. So there's, you don't have to create a complete internal world model. You're just dealing with obstacles that are in near space. Here's a simulation of what that looks like. So here's a, avoiding that obstacle en route to a goal. And these, again, look uh, very similar to human trajectories. So here are human paths avoiding these three different goals and the model paths. Here's the time series of the heading error. Right, so now we're steering away from the direction of the goal of the obstacle, I should say, and the model also steers away from the direction of the obstacle with very strong uh, correlations. So it looks like obstacles behave as repellers of heading, whereas goals behave as attractors of heading. What about moving things? Okay, a moving target or a moving obstacle. Well, we adopted here the constant bearing model, okay, which had appeared in the literature, you know, I mean, it's sailors uh, use this to avoid collisions with other boats, right? And the basic idea is that if the other boat is moving on this path and you're moving on this path, um, if the other boat remains in a constant bearing direction in space, you're on a collision course with that boat. So if you want to ram the other boat, you should steer so that you maintain a constant bearing direction to the target. Um, and so we can essentially write a little dynamical system that does that. It's now, instead of nulling an angle, it's nulling change in that angle. And so you end up with a constant uh, bearing direction, having the target in a constant bearing direction. Um, and so maybe I'll just play that again. So in this case, if this is the target, and here is the person who's intercepting the target, um, essentially the interception path now behaves as an attractor, rather than the goal itself behaving as an attractor. And this too fits very well with human data. Um, the human data is in red and the model is in uh, black, and they're basically right on top of each other with targets moving in different trajectories. And the time series of this um, heading error now increases to some constant value and then levels off. So that's that constant uh, bearing direction. Finally, moving obstacle, same thing except we're now switching the sign again on this uh, stiffness term in the model. And so now instead of intercepting this moving target, you're repelled away from the interception path with that obstacle, I should say. So the interception path behaves as a repeller. Um, and successfully avoid obstacles in this manner. And interestingly, we've done some experiments where we substitute other people, right, for the obstacles or the moving targets, and the behavior is fundamentally the same. So the same model captures pedestrians interacting with each other as well as people avoiding inanimate objects. Here's the data from moving targets, sorry, moving obstacle experiments. So here's the subject's trajectory to the goal. Here's the moving obstacle. And the model is the dashed line, the human is the solid line. And you can see the sort of switching behavior. So as the target speed increases, 
In this case, both the humans and the model go ahead of the uh, moving obstacle, and in this case, they go behind the moving obstacle as it passes. So again, it predicts the sort of switching behavior between the rules. So thinking about crowds now, pedestrians interact with each other in other ways as well. So we may follow our neighbors. We just did this going to lunch, right? So we walked uh, together with a person as we were walking along. Um, and so we started, we did some experiments to look at how one person follows another, how do, how do you follow a leader. Um, and it turned out, experimentally, that the follower matches the leader's speed. Okay? They don't keep a constant distance from the leader, despite that was our instruction, right? Keep a constant distance, follow this person at a constant distance. Rather, they match the leader's speed. Um, and they do so, we found in other experiments, by nulling change in the visual angle of the leader. So if you get, as, as, if you're going faster than the leader, their visual angle expands. If you're going slower than the leader, their visual angle decreases. And so by, mat, by moving to null change in that visual angle, you match the, their speed. Uh, and so we get a simulation that looks like this. The follower there is now starting to walk the same speed as the leader. And in other experiments, we've shown that the same thing happens in side-by-side -side walking, like this, right? So that um, if you're walking next to somebody, you, you will match their speed. Interestingly, you don't stay abreast with them. You end up matching, matching their speed. So there's a question here about the field of view. If you're in a crowd, what's the field of view that you're responding to? Right? So we begin to think of a field of interaction around each member of a crowd, and what is the, um, the visual angle, the field of view of that interaction. Finally, when you're following someone, there's also this question of, of controlling your steering direction. Right? So um, we are, have collected data on this but haven't analyzed it yet, but we're simulating this as the follower matching the heading of the leader. Okay, so it's a heading alignment model. So if the leader starts turning to the right, the follower will also turn so as to travel in the same direction. Um, and so what does that look like? Looks like that. Okay, so the person behind turns to end up traveling in the same direction as the leader. Um, and again, there's a question about the field of view under which you will do that, right? Is it a narrow field of view or will you match uh, the directions of people um, off to your side. Finally, there's braking. All right, um, you don't want to run into things, and so sometimes these other systems may fail, and you may get too close to somebody who's right, walking right in front of you. And so there's the tau dot model to control braking, which comes from David Lee's famous work in the 70s. Um, we found uh, some empirical evidence consistent with using tau dot to control your deceleration as you brake, um, and we're planning some tests to look at how that's done in walking. But for the moment, we're using the tau dot model, so the follower will decelerate as a function of the rate of change in their time to contact with the leader. Okay. All right, and that looks like this. So you just won't run into things. All right, so now we get to collective behavior. We build these components, and now the question is, if we put them together, can we understand situations like this, Grand Central Station in New York, and how people walk together in groups, or avoid each other as moving obstacles, may join up as a large crowd on their way to the platform, um, and so on. So, at this point, we're just doing simulations in which we're trying to capture the general traffic patterns, right, in these scenes. But as we go further with our simulations, we're going to try to see if we can simulate individual trajectories in a, a crowd like this. So the questions on the table now are, what are, you know, first of all, will combining the components that we've already measured allow us to simulate crowds? So will the crowd behavior be emergent from these local interactions? And what, if so, what's the minimal set of components that's necessary to reproduce a global pattern? Um, can we generate coordination in a crowd okay, through these local components? And can we understand that coordination as being self-organized? All right, so uh, last summer we took over a, a room at Brown, the largest room 
find on campus um, and set up our uh, call assist cameras to do motion tracking in this large area and uh, tracked a bunch of uh, groups of up to 20 people in different pedestrian scenarios. So we did this for a whole week, tried to recruit large groups of subjects and collected a whole lot of data that we're still try just trying to process. Right? This is going to take ages. Um, so people are wearing these funny helmets. Um, and in this case, this is the Grand Central Station scenario where we've got these people walking around, they're avoiding these stationary obstacles, and they're avoiding each other. Um, each one has a goal. There are numbers posted on, around the room. So they walk across the room to their goal, then they'll get another number and walk back across the room. So they keep crisscrossing the space for three minutes, creating these patterns of motion. And here's the tracking data from the, the uh, helmets, from the tracking cameras. And so you get a pretty good reconstruction of all the trajectories of these people in space. Okay. So uh, the idea is that once we have these trajectories, we can then try to see how closely we can approximate them using the model. For now, I can show you uh, a simulation. So here's the Grand Central Station simulation with a set of obstacles in the same configuration, initial positions for all the people in the same place. Um, and this is what it looks like. So they are successfully avoiding obstacles, each other, um, decelerating a little bit when they get forced into a corner, and no, you know, no deaths, right, in the simulation. So this, the minimal model that was needed to produce this reasonable pattern was the goal component, the obstacle component, the moving obstacle component, and the emergency braking component. And that's sufficient to generate basically individuals, right, crisscrossing uh, with each other. The individual trajectories are human-like and smooth, unlike many of the crowd simulations you see online, which the individual motions look nothing like human uh, pedestrian track. So now we get to what I think of as the kind of big question about coordination in a crowd. Like, can we um, understand and simulate uh, how groups form, right, um, in a crowd? So this is this transition from individual to collective behavior. So if you think about this, um, we started looking at groups of four people. And if you think about this, um, each person has two degrees of freedom at any moment, right? There's a direction and speed of, that they're walking. And so a group of four people will have a total of eight degrees of freedom. And the question is, if they're coordinated, there'll be a reduction in the degrees of freedom. And if they're completely coordinated, that will be reduced to two. So the whole group will behave as though they have a common speed and a common direction. So that's the question. It's an empirical question. Do groups actually behave like this? Are the degrees of freedom compressed? Um, and if so, how do we measure that? What's a good order parameter for measuring the order of the system? And what, under what conditions do you observe this sort of coordination? So what are the control parameters that may induce this sort of coordination? And density, in my mind, is a good candidate. That as the density of the crowd increases, people may coordinate more. So that's an empirical question. So here's some data with four people. In this paradigm, we have them walking uh, to one of these three goals. So they started walking, and then there was a, a command to go to goal number one, two, or three, and they would all uh, walk to that goal. Um, we varied the initial density of this group. There were four different densities, how close together they were at the beginning. Um, and we compared their measurements on this data to a virtual group, okay, where we randomly selected the same participants but from different trials um, and looked at the, the kind of uh, default coordination that was happening with random pairs of people. Or random groups of four people. Um, so we're now right, playing this game where we're saying, all right, can we make measurements on this group that's going to, uh, we're going to try to see if they're reducing the degrees of freedom, if there is dimensional compression. One way to do that is, to, is principal components analysis. So we took uh, that data um, from the different densities and the, and the different goal positions um, and looked at a PCA on the real data, which is in blue, and the virtual data, the virtual groups of four, which is in red. This is the number of components necessary to account for 90% of the variance in the data. Um, and what you see is that the real groups, right, 
um, have significant dimensionality reduction compared to uh, the virtual groups. So it looks like real groups um, need fewer components, okay, to explain 90% of the variance. Um, and then if you look at the amount of variance accounted for by the first uh, principal component, for the three goals in this case, uh, the real pairs account for a significantly greater proportion of the variance uh, than the virtual, sorry, virtual groups do. So more of the variance is explained in the real groups, okay, than in the virtual groups. So again, it looks like the real groups, there is a reduction in the degrees of freedom. There is a dimensionality compression uh, when people are walking together in a group. Um, so that is evidence of kind of spontaneous coordination as people walk together, because we can tell them to walk together. We just said walk to the goal when we say to walk to that goal. However, there was no effect of density, as you notice, right? Um, the, in all the analyses that we did, um, the groups that were far apart coordinated just as much as the groups that were close together, somewhat to my surprise. Uh, another way to look at this um, is using nonlinear methods, and we heard this morning about uh, uh, recurrence quantification analysis. Um, here is a cross-recurrence quantification analysis where you're looking at, um, in this group of four people, there are six possible pairs, right, six dyads, and so we do a pairwise cross-recurrence quantification analysis on every pair in this group to look um, to see if there is a significant uh, coupling between them, and what uh, CRQ does is it looks at the degree of coupling over different time scales. A simple correlation is looking at exactly one time scale. Cross recurrence looks at coordination along multiple time scales. Um, one of the measures that comes out is max line. It's a measure of the temporal stability of that coupling over different temporal scales. So how long will uh, a certain pattern, will a pair of people remain coordinated? Right? in this case in their speed, right, um, over all of the time series samples that we uh, collected. So this analysis is just done on speed at this point. And it turns out that for the different densities um, and the six different pairs within each group at each density, um, real pairs are more strongly coupled, have longer max line measures than virtual pairs do. And so again, this is evidence not only of a reduction in degrees of freedom, but of a stronger coupling okay, between pairs in the group um, than if they're uncoordinated, right? that is if they're walking in a virtual group. Again, however, there's no apparent influence of density. right? So um, people in this extra wide condition that are very far apart um, have just, are just as stably coupled as people that are close together. Again, to my surprise. But this is just, just the beginning. We don't know yet what the real answer is. So another, in a group of 20, we looked at a random swarm scenario. And this is this, this question of, right, does coherence emerge out of large numbers of people? And so we had 20 people wandering around this room, and the instruction was simply randomly veer <laughs> left or right um, and stay together. So there was no timing signal, there was no goal, it was just walk around, veering left and right, but stay together. So there was a, a, a constraint of coordination in this case. Uh, and so you can see the tracking data, and it's one of the number of interesting things pop out. The leaders change, right? So when they turn a corner, people on one side of the crowd end up being in front, and they kind of take over the role of leader. Sometimes little groups break off and get lost and then merge back in with the crowd. So there's all kinds of interesting things and stuff that's going on. Um, so we have just begun to try to simulate this data. Um, and here's an example. So there is a goal now that the three people with halos, little red halos, we can find them, those two, um, are those three right there, are heading toward the goal because we had to provide some direction right, um, at the front of the crowd. And the rest of the crowd behavior is what we're really interested in. And so what you can see is similar sorts of things. So the simulation here just has speed matching, heading alignment, and emergency braking. And that's sufficient to generate this uh, fairly coordinated behavior where the front of the, of the group may turn and then the back of the group follows, much like the human 
data you saw a moment ago. Sometimes you see groups break off and rejoin. Um, and so we're just beginning uh, to fool around with this. What's interesting is that the simulation uh, builds in an enslavement principle, which falls right out of the models, the components I just described, which is um, that there's a, an area within which you are influenced by your neighbors. So as more neighbors are within your area, you are increasingly influenced by their behavior. Um, as more of those neighbors do the same thing, their force adds, right, sums. And so their influence, if they're aligned, is going to draw you into alignment more strongly than if they are not aligned. And so there is a, a, a top-down as well as bottom-up, right, or upward and downward causality in the simulations. We're still trying to, and we need to figure it out if that's going on in the human crowd, and that's one of the goals that we're after. Another interesting result of this is that uh, we had to turn, our first attempt was to include the moving obstacle component in here so people wouldn't run into each other in the crowd. But it turned out the breaking, emergency breaking component was sufficient for that to keep people from running into each other at close distances. Um, and if we had the moving obstacle component active, the crowd was extremely unstable, right? People would veer away from each other and break off uh, all the time. And so one of the, the kind of simulation results is that Crowd formation may involve actually switching between components. So whatever the conditions for self-organization are, they may be implemented by modulating the coupling strengths, right, the activities of these different components in the model. All right. Um, maybe I will be interested in time. Yeah, skip this. So we're making some measures on these crowds to try to figure out if we can induce the coupling and the the size of the field, uh, of which people are coupled together. Um, but I want to do one more scenario, which is the sort of counterflow case, where two groups are walking toward each other, and you see this beautiful lane formation happen spontaneously, right? So, and those lanes persist even after the other small, smaller group has passed through the larger group. Um, and so that's really interesting. And so, we, it turns out we can produce something very similar just with speed matching, heading alignment, um, and breaking the same model components we did before, plus introducing the members of the opposing group as moving obstacles. And so you get the sort of lane formation again that persists after the groups pass through each other um, due to this following component, right? So those, those lanes will, for a while, hold their form. Um, so now this raises the interesting question of, um, there's an in-group, out-group relationship where the in-group you treat as uh, neighbors that you're following and the out-group you treat as moving obstacles to avoid. And how does that get defined? You don't, you know, we did it this way by just saying the opposing group are moving obstacles. But maybe there's a subtler way that this happens. For example, the angle of approach, right, of two different people may determine whether they're followed or whether they're avoided. So those are, again, questions for, for further So what we're going to do next is put humans into a virtual crowd. Okay, so in the Venn lab we can simulate virtual neighbors, virtual pedestrians that we can make move in arbitrary ways. Um, and so we're going to try to measure their influence on a human pedestrian and try to start looking at the coupling strength. Does it decay with distance? Does it decay with how far away the neighbors are? The topological distance of the neighbor or metric distance of the neighbor? Um, does the influence of neighbors sum in particular ways? And so once we really characterize those couplings, um, and hopefully they'll converge through the measurements we're making on the swarm data, uh, we can, I think, converge on a really uh, good model of these neighbor interactions in the crowd. Okay, so what am I claiming? Um, well, at the individual, I'm just going to say at the individual and collective levels, I think we've shown both experimentally and in simulation that behavior arises after the fact, okay, as a stable solution of the agent environment dynamics. Um, the trajectories of individual pedestrians emerge online without internal models, right, or explicit path planning, because our model doesn't have any of that, and so far we're doing, we're able to reproduce the human trajectories reasonably well. Um, and, you know, the questions I think that are outstanding are whether collective behavior really does involve the sort of enslavement principle in a uh, human crowd, 
and uh, whether forming a crowd involves switching between these uh, elementary components and how that happens right, within a self-organization self framework. Okay, um, stop there. Sorry for running a bit over. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.